really exciting. Oh, sorry. I'm supposed to remind you, first of all, that this meeting is being recorded and uh, also to mute your, um, mute your line if you can. So we established this clinical trial unit because the numbers of, of, of clinical trials have really um, expanded remarkably. This is a really exciting time to be involved in ALS clinical trial um, research. And so I thought we would um, start by having a, a lecture series and we're gonna invite people both from Hopkins, but also outside the institution as well. And um, the other thing we thought we would do is have a, a mix. So we have basic scientists, um, uh, participating today. We have clinicians, clinician scientists, medical students, um, neurology faculty. So it's going to be, I think, a, a, a broad and diverse group. So I'm going to try to, to straddle the line and hopefully um, th this will be interesting for, for a number of you. So today I'm going to talk about the expanding landscape of therapeutic targets in ALS clinical trials. And these are my um, disclosures. And just broadly, what, what do I hope that you'll, you'll go home with today? First of all, most importantly, I'm going to give you a high altitude view, but this is really, we're in a time of unprecedented breadth of ALS relevant molecular targets. And I hope that you, um, you know, you can appreciate that by the time we're finished today. I'm not going to spend, I'm not, it's not going to be an exhaustive list, but I've picked a, some specific targets that I think will demonstrate that, that feature. Um, we're going to talk about the interaction amongst, um, both neuronal and non-neuronal cell types, a number of drugs are targeting both of those um, uh, different um, elements of ALS disease progression. I want to highlight the translational efforts leading to clinical trials of, of an investigational product. So we'll touch a little bit, maybe a slide or two on some of the, some of the basic science elements that really brought some of these drugs to, um, to trial. And then I'm going to share with you some promising results from some very early phase studies. We've really seen in the last really three or four months um, uh, several studies that have been, uh, are, are very promising. So I'm, I'm going to highlight a couple of those. So when patients ask you, or, um, you know, some of these things come up in the news that you'll be able to at least have heard it before. So we, as, as we start, we've really thought differently about, um, therapeutic targeting with respect to ALS. And this is, you know, naturally has evolved over the last 20 years. And as I look back on some of the trials we did in the early 2000s, they seem really quite, um, although I think best efforts were made, I think we've come a long way in trying to think um, more appropriately uh, about uh, the potential for success. So one of the first things we're starting to ask now, you'll see is, do we target familial ALS, sporadic ALS, or both? Is any particular investigational product good for both diseases? And I'll show you some examples of some gene therapies that target specifically familial ALS. The strength of the preclinical data, and, and, and I asked her what preclinical models are being utilized. It used to be that almost everything ran through the SOD1 mouse, and success in the SOD1 mouse has not predicted success in ALS patients. And so I think there's a growing acceptance of using other preclinical models, and those can include human IPS cells, which give us a lot of opportunities to think about ALS heterogeneity and diversity, but also other models, I think, are being increasingly accepted as potential um, jump offs for moving forward to, um, to clinical trial. Is there evidence of target engagement by the drug of interest? And this might seem you know, obvious, but as I pointed out, if I look back 20 years ago, um, I guess the question was, you know, are these targets, whatever they might be, are they abnormal in ALS? And is the drug getting to its, um, to its intended target? We've also seen an enormous growth in the use of biomarkers in clinical trial design. And some of these still remain exploratory, but I think a lot of them are gaining traction. I'm gonna show you an example today, how genetics has really um, um, modified our strategy about how we think about targeting um, specific um, uh, patient populations. The use of biofluids, be that CSF or serum to look at things like neurofilaments. Electrophysiological measurements, we don't think of as biomarkers, um, but even things that um, uh, can be used in the EMG laboratory can be helpful. And finally, imaging, I'm not gonna speak to that specifically today, but there's a growth and an interest in using imaging. PK and PD data, um, does the drug penetrate the blood brain barrier? I mean, that seems like a somewhat obvious question, but I'm gonna talk about a couple of these today that don't. It doesn't mean that they can't work on a, a different mechanism or a different target. 
Um, but these are things we all want to know. And then what are the PK, PK or PD um, data? And finally, important to patients, what is the method of delivery or the ease of delivery, oral medication versus an IV medication and so forth? We also think about how patients should be stratified for enrollment. That is, do we stratify them by the rate of disease decline? And you're going to see a few studies in which that's been the case with more rapidly progressing patients being chosen um, to participate in studies. But what are some other clinical measures we can use and how can we think about using biomarkers as well? I want to touch on this briefly because this, is, this could be a lecture in and of itself, and I'm certainly not the expert in outcome measures in ALS, but I do want to highlight a couple of them that we use particularly as primary outcome measures. This one here is the ALS FRS or the ALS Functional Rating Scale. And it's really used in almost all clinical trials as a, as a primary outcome measure. It's a, um, it's a, um, uh, a functional status. It's a questionnaire it consists of 48 points, if you will. The higher the number, the better the patient is, is doing. And it's that decline in the ALS functional rating scale that's used as a measure of um, success, let's say, of, uh, of a drug's efficacy. And it's really currently that the ALS FRS and survival are currently used as um, standards by which the FDA would potentially approve a drug. But we also use things like um, pulmonary force vital capacity, critical measures of um, ALS function, <clears throat> that is respiratory function, and do things like handheld dy dynamometry to, to, to measure strength. So these are, uh, these are amongst the kind of some of the key measures that we use. There are, however, numerous others that are incorporated into clinical trial design. So I wanted to show this slide, um, particularly because I'm going to give examples of, uh, this, is, um, this is a motor neuron here, and this is a muscle. I had to incorporate something very peripheral. Um, but these are examples of potential pathways thought to be involved in ALS pathogenesis. Um, we have astrocytes and microglia here. Um, a red circle, I've, I've, I've circled around every drug that we want to talk about today, and hopefully you'll appreciate that there are a number of different, again, um, ALS um, relevant targets. This either tells me that it's exciting because we have a lot of potential targets, or the downside, we maybe we don't really understand the real pathogenesis of ALS, so maybe this will be narrowed down as time goes by. But I think it's actually really exciting that we have a number of pathways of interest. So let's start off by looking at some gene therapy targets. And I call this gene therapy very broadly. And I'm gonna speak specifically to antisense oligonucleotide mediated therapies. And this has really grown out of the wealth of new information we're starting to understand about SOD1 mutations and C9 hexanucleotide expansion repeats um, and other um, ALS relevant mutations as well. And the idea is not unique to, to um, to ALS, it's certainly being used for other neurological diseases as well. The, 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 the mechanisms are, are, are numerous, but uh, the ones we're gonna talk about today are ASOs binding to target um, mRNA, activating RNAs, and subsequently re resulting in target mRNA degradation. There are other antisense oligonucleotides, that is those for use like disorders such as spinal muscular atrophy, where those involve splicing modifications to either include or exclude an exon. And finally, microRNA targeting can also be um, targeted by these antisense oligonucleotides. But we're primarily going to be focused on this today, and that is targeting mRNA degradation and subsequent reduction in protein expression. One of the challenges with antisense um, oligonucleotide-mediated therapies is they don't really cross the blood-brain barrier, so they need to be administered intrathecally uh, and, and, and generally repeatedly over a period of, let's say, a month or two months or three months. So this requires a lumbar puncture where a needle is placed into the cerebrospinal fluid, and subsequently these, these drugs are being administered in that way. So the first one I want to talk about is this study. Uh, this is the Valor study. And, um, this is a, what started as a phase one study, and it's now in its pivotal phase. But to look at this, whoops, to look at this um, compound designed by um, Biogen, and much of the preclinical work was spearheaded by Tim Miller. But this, uh, this compound is thought to bind to both the normal and mutated copies of SOD, the SOD1 gene. And the idea is this binding may reduce the amount of both normal and toxic SOD1 protein. So it doesn't discern between those two. The main goal of this study, actually was the first one for ALS, was really 
to look at safety and tolerability. It induces RNAs degradation of these RNA transcripts. Again, it's an intrathecal study and the, the length of the study was 36 weeks. And so the idea here is that it will reduce both misfolded SOD1, which subsequently is thought to aggregate and gum up the system for lack of a better term, but it also reduces wild type SOD1. And through some beautiful preclinical work, it was determined that at the levels these are being reduced, it doesn't seem to be detrimental uh, to normal patients. So these are, the, these are the results of the Valor study, which were recently, produced, recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This drug is now called Tofersen. This was a phase one, two, and it really has changed the way we've uh, been thinking about ALS clinical trials with some really exciting data. The, the, the major outcome was really the following, um, that in a dose-dependent fashion, um, looking at the concentrations of SOD1, uh, protein in the cerebrospinal fluid. But in a dose-dependent fashion, you can see 20, 40, 60, and 100 milligrams of tofersen compared to placebo, that over the period of this 85 days, that in fact, there was a dose-dependent reduction of SOD1. So I talked earlier about in target engagement. And so this was a really exciting demonstration that we could actually, not, we as a group, could knock down this um, relevant protein in a dose-dependent way. If, although not designed to, to look at specifically at, at these outcome measures, there were three elements, the total ALS functional rating scale, the vi pulmonary vital capacity and handheld dynamometry. And these were in um, uh, all groups here, fast patients who had rapidly progressing disease here and then other subgroups here. The placebo is here in, in, in blue. And I hope what I, you can appreciate is over this 85 day time frame, particularly here in those patients with fast progressing disease, that those who took placebo progressed or got worse quite rapidly with regard to the ALS functional rating scale, breathing capacity, and even handheld dynamometry. But really exciting with these data that have teased us to suggest that those who are receiving this drug maintain these measures. So this is in its pivotal phase now um, with about 50 patients, I think, being um, recruited to see whether in this fast progressing group, whether this function can be maintained. So these were awaiting the um, results of this trial, patients are still being enrolled. So this is actually really exciting from the standpoint of target engagement, use of a biomarker, and some very interesting uh, uh, early data. So then the cousin to this, if you will, really, <clears throat> um, stems from this idea of the C9 hexanucleotide expansion repeat, a much more common mutation in ALS, representing about 7% of patients as opposed to the 1% who have SOD1. But some really um, uh, beautiful work by Jeff, Jeff Rothstein uh, and colleagues and Clotilde Lagier-Turin and colleagues, and finally Leonard Petrocelli demonstrated three key mechanisms. Not only that this was an important <clears throat> gene, and this was genes that were um, discovered by Brian Trainer and, and Rosa Rademacher back in 2011 now. But importantly, that RNA toxicity from these mutations could be mitigated by antisense oligonucleotides using in vitro studies. And then Clotilde demonstrated this in vivo. And finally, Leonard Petrocelli's group looked at a, a biomarker of these, um, uh, uh, of these DPRs to demonstrate that that could be, antisense oligonucleotides could repeat, reduce these DPRs. So this has now spawned another trial. These are now patients uh, that target the C9 um, mutation. And again, this is early days. These are, uh, um, this is a very early study that target only those mutations that have the, the, the repeat expansion. So this drug targets this, um, uh, this variation with the expansion, this variant with the expansion, but not this one, which has a normal number of expansion repeats. So the idea is that this will reduce these toxic RNA species and hopefully mitigate disease. The third one in this group is ataxin-2, and this is really work spawned by uh, Aaron Gittler, who demonstrated that ataxin-2, these intermediate um, length polynucleotide expansions were associated with increased risk for ALS, even in patients with sporadic disease. And he then went on to demonstrate that in a TDP43 mouse, if he knocked down the ataxin repeat using an antisense oligonucleotide that he was able to reduce the, number, the amount of ataxin too. And when he administered it to these mice that normally died a very early age, 25 to 30 days, they could actually prolong survival and improve, um, and improve gait. 
So this is now um, expanded to a, uh, a new trial, again, using intrathecal administration to target this, um, this expansion repeat in the ataxin 2 uh, mutation. So that's a very quick um, overview. And I think hopefully later in the year, we'll get some of the experts who have really helped to design these studies to talk about these in greater detail. How about targeting nucleocytoplasmic transport. This is a common and really emerging and really exciting theme in ALS. And I want to highlight one here. Um, this was demonstrated by Tom Lloyd and, and Jeff Rostian that these C9 repeat expansions can disrupt nucleocytoplasmic transport. And I'm uh, certainly not going to go through the, uh, all the data, but one particular drug here called KPT-276 was used in, in, in Tom's Drosophila model. And he found that this drug which blocks nuclear um, uh, export in one and blocks nuclear export could actually um, restore, if you will, this abnormal I phenotype. So this is, um, these are the uh, repeat expansions here producing an abnormal I phenotype that could be re uh, rescued by this, by this compound. And then Jeff's lab actually um, went on along with Chris Ross to look at mutant Huntington's and they actually looked at the drug that I'm gonna talk about in a little more detail, KPT350, to show that when this drug was administered um, uh, to Huntington's uh, IPS cells, that this went from a cytoplasmic mislocalization of this protein to a nuclear um, retention of this protein. So the idea being that this, this compound could keep uh, proteins of interest within the nucleus itself. So this is the idea, this is BIB100, KPT350. And this is a very early phase study. Um, the idea is that this is a first in trial uh, for, for ALS. And again, just to look at safety. So this is administering patients a single dose of this drug. And we've been looking at variations of this dose and higher and higher doses. So this is a, an inpatient hospital stay for three days to look at PD and PK uh, measurements. It's an oral drug. And the length of this study is really just over six weeks. The idea would be that, um, that key proteins that, are, that should be in the nucleus will be, will be maintained in the nucleus without getting uh, mislocalized to the cytoplasm. And again, this is a whole um, discussion of this biology in and of itself. But this is exciting. Again, I want to stress that this is a new uh, therapeutic target. So what about neuroinflammatory pathways? These are really, um, we've seen a, a great, um, we've looked at neuroinflammatory pathways in the past, but I think these strategies are getting more sophisticated as we've um, gone along. So I wanna talk about um, a couple of drugs here. And these are really, um, one of these is called Abutilast, developed by Medicinova. It's a non-selective phosphodiesterase inhibitor. It's actually already approved in other countries as an anti-asthmatic medication to reduce the re release of leukotrienes, cytokines. And the idea is that it could modulate survival and activation of immune cells in the CNS by uh, preventing the production of pro-inflammatory agents. And the target here really are uh, microglia and monocytes. So this is a butylast here as a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, inhibiting the subsequent release of cytokines. And these are, again, not necessarily new targets or new ideas in the context of ALS, but I think valid nonetheless, because we see some of these um, cytokines, um, um, leukotrienes and so forth that are elevated in the context of ALS. And, and there was a study of, of 51 early ALS patients of this drug that was encouraging and subsequently led this group to propose a phase three trial. So this is where we are now currently in a phase three trial. It's an oral administration of a drug, and this is a long trial, it's a 13 month trial with an optional open label extension. There's another drug um, called mesitinib, which was really, um, uh, uh, much of this uh, work was done in, in Europe. It was developed by AB Sciences. And it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that also probably acts on microglia uh, and monocytes. It was originally designed as a mast cell mediated um, inhibitor of degranulation. The idea again is inhibits the release of these cytotoxic factors. And so this was a, a paper published just recently, although this work went on some time ago. Uh, and it, the results from this study, albeit a small study, suggested that mesitinib at the dose described above um, was interesting and potentially beneficial. And now it's gone on to a confirmatory phase three study. And this is now underway in a number of institutions really worldwide. 
So again, a, a similar target, uh, but, a, but a different drug. How about immune-mediated medi ALS therapy? So we always used to say that ALS is not an autoimmune disease. And well, you know, it may not be an autoimmune disease. I think as we've become more sophisticated about thinking that, about the relationship between the immune system and the central nervous system and also neurodegenerative diseases, some of these drugs have, have, have gained traction once again. So I'm gonna tell you, it's, the details of this, of this table are not important but only to tell you this is particularly with regard to the complement system in ALS. And what I would tell you is, is this, that there is evidence both in patients, autopsy tissue, patient samples, as well as some of our ALS animal models to suggest the complement system may be activated. And this has really spawned three um, trials that I'm gonna tell you about um, now um, in ALS. So how might the complement system be acting in ALS? There's, one theory that at least in part, it may be acting at the neuromuscular junction with complement deposition at the neuromuscular junction that could be influencing the way motor neurons connect to muscles. This is part of a whole dying back hypothesis, which is really quite interesting. Um, and I think um, really could be one of the uh, relevant players in ALS. So could mediating the complement system at the neuromuscular junction be playing a role? Certainly complement mediated um, dysfunction could be playing a role in the central nervous system as well. It's worthwhile noting that these drugs that have been um, proposed, at least two of the three drugs, probably don't cross the blood-brain barrier, which would suggest that their, their activity would primarily be playing a role um, at the site of the neuromuscular junction. So one of these drugs is from a company called Apellus. So this is actually a large international study and this drug APL2 blocks the C3 component of this complement cascade. Um, and I am, I am not a, um, an immunologist. So that's, that's what I'm going, I'm gonna leave it at, at that saying that it blocks complement mediated cascade at the level of C3, which subsequently reduces downstream inflammation um, and also um, a reduction of the membrane attack complex. This drug, does not cross the blood-brain barrier and it's administered subcutaneously. An exciting part about, about this would be that it's only administered twice per week. So potentially being exciting to some patients, let's say who couldn't swallow um, or who didn't wanna take um, oral medication as frequently as every day. And this is a one year uh, randomized study. Similarly, this, um, this is a drug called ravulizumab developed by Alexion Pharmaceuticals. And this um, inhibits, is a little bit further downstream and inhibits um, C5, so another part of the complement mediated cascade, which is particularly relevant in the forming the membrane attack complex, which uh, results in cell swelling and subsequent um, cytotoxicity. So this route of administration is intravenous and it's also not thought to cross the blood brain barrier. And this study like that from a palace is about a year long study. I'm gonna mention the third one as part of the Healy platform study. Um, there's another study that um, we're launching called um, for a drug called AT1501. This is from a company called Analixis. And the idea here is that it targets this CD40 ligand, this soluble CD40 ligand. And this was really spawned by some data from ALS TDI. And this was a, uh, a drug that was studied by this group in lots and lots of SOD1 mice. And in fact, in their SOD1 mouse colony, they were very rigorous about looking for mouse survival in a very statistically um, relevant and a highly, um, with a lot of fidelity. Um, and this was one of the most successful drugs that they had ever seen with regard to pro prolonging uh, survival of the SOD1 mouse. And so there are reasons uh, um, why this drug, which acts peripherally, may be relevant as we think about um, immune mediated function in ALS. And this is administered intravenously and it's a shorter study because this is a phase two, <coughs> Um, phase two study. So I want to take a break, if you will, and, and, and shift gears um, a little bit and then give a shout out to this, this, this new effort as we talk about clinical trials and clinical trial design and how we think about therapeutics to talk, um, and this is with permission from my colleagues, um, Sabrina Paganoni and Merit Sitkovich, to use a few of these slides. This is really the Healy ALS platform trial, and I'm just going to do a three or four slides along those lines. But it was really spearheaded and centered here at Massachusetts General Hospital, but really includes um, institutions from around the country. 
Um, so what is a platform trial? A platform trial enables multiple drugs to be tested at the same time using specialized statistical tools where new drugs can be added as they become available. So this is like a rolling trial. This decreases or eliminates the gap in time from identification of a potential therapy to actual testing of that therapy. So the old school way would be if we wanted to test 10 therapies, it would require 2,400 participants, let's say, and 12 of, 1,200 of those, in other words, half of those would be placebo. And that would take about 12 years to occur. But with a platform study, this time can be shortened to four years. And for example, you could use 1,600 participants, but only 400 placebos patients would be necessary. And this, of course, assumes uh, uh, this caveat here. So what's exciting about this? This is really um, leans and leverages the Niels Consortium uh, of, of research uh, centers really all around the country. So this can will allow people people and patients from all over the country to participate in this trial. It utilizes a central IRB. The Niels um, Consortium has 20 plus years of experience already with 57 ALS studies. So this is already, this is a trial that's already underway. And this is the idea. And <clears throat> when patients consent they, to enroll in the platform study, that, so they have to qualify or be included in the platform study, they're subsequently randomized into one of three therapies, therapy A, B, or C, let's say. And if they're randomized to therapy A, then there's subsequently three of, the, of those patients will get active drug and the fourth patient will get placebo. And this is really where the power of this study is because these are run concurrently, these placebos can be shared amongst all of the different um, therapies. At the end of this six month study, patients can even either choose to become part of an open label extension, that is getting active drug, or they can ask to be re-randomized into, into one of these other therapies. So what are the three current drugs that are being um, studied here? The first one is regimen A, xyluclopan. Zylu this is developed by raw pharmaceuticals. And much like I told you before, this targets the C5 component of the pathway which is involved in terminal complement activation. It's administered subcutaneously. And this group believes that their, their drug may actually be able to cross the blood-brain barrier and act centrally. The second drug, regimen B, is verdiprostat. And again, this is a new therapeutic target. It targets myeloperoxidase. So it's a myeloperoxidase inhibitor, a particularly abundant enzyme in microglia. And it's a lysosomal enzyme, even though I put it in the mitochondria, because it, the idea is that it's believed to reduce reactive oxygen species, and it's administered orally. The third drug, um, which was developed by Clean Nanomedicine and, and has been studied um, on IPS cells in my laboratory, is the suspension of gold nanocrystals. And this, um, there are several potential mechanisms by which this may occur. One of the, uh, the idea is that it improves or makes more efficient metabolism of ATP generating pathways, it probably has antioxidant activities as well. And the, its administration is through an oral suspension. So again, three very different drugs with three very different pathways. And so the first three drugs involved in the Petili trial are Xyluclopan, Verdiprostat, and CNMAU8. But over the last month, the fourth drug has now been added. I mentioned this rolling trial, a drug called Pradopidine, which is a Sigma-1 receptor agonist. And soon to come is IC14, which is an immunotherapy, immunotherapy targeting CD14. So what about models of cellular stress or targets of cellular stress? This is an important um, trial, particularly because many of you may have heard in the news, and if you're a clinician, you may have, um, your patients may have, have, have brought this to your attention if you didn't know about it already. This was called the CENTAR trial. The drug is called AMX0035. Um, it's a combination therapy of sodium phenylbutyrate and terosodiol. Um, and the idea is that it probably acts in several, via several potential mechanisms to reduce ER stress, to modify apoptotic cascades, and to reduce uh, reactive oxygen species production. So again, potentially three very different cellular targets. The clinical trial was designed to, to look at safety and tolerability but also look at the ALS functional rating scale. It was a six month study. 
I want to show you these data, which were recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I think this was September or October. But this was actually really exciting because not only was the drug found to be safe and well tolerated, but it resulted in a slower functional decline when compared to placebo on the ALS functional rating scale over a period of 24 weeks. Um, there were some secondary outcome measures which were not significantly different. But this idea in a six month study that it could, it could slow this important um, outcome measure of the ALS functional rating scale has now um, spurred the company to seek um, further guidance from the FDA with regard to how this drug might be potentially taken forward. So there's a lot of enthusiasm in the ALS clinic and the ALS community uh, about this drug itself. This was really followed up by a second publication that just came out, what, uh, a month or so ago? When patients finished the six-month trial, they were then allowed to in survival of about six months. So this is actually a potentially really exciting follow-up data. If we think about the average survival in, uh, for patients who receive our current standard of care of really is all of about three months, this could potentially represent um, what I think is probably a, a, an interesting uh, signal. And so this is currently being evaluated um, by the FDA. Um, as we think about cellular stress, I just wanna make a note of this, this drug this drug is um, from a company called Orphozyme. And the idea here, again, a different pathway, the activation of heat shock factor one. Um, and the idea is, as we talk about dysfunctional proteins and protein misfolding, when proteins become misfolded, much like SOD1 might become misfolded, it may also form aggregates. And the idea behind this um, compound um, called aromoclamol is that it would activate these heat shock factors restore normal protein function and reduce aggregate formation leading to degradation of these uh, abnormal aggregates. Um, so this is also an oral capsule. It's a phase three study going on um, internationally. It was spurred by some very um, early data in, 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 in SOD1, uh, really spearheaded by Michael Benatar. And although these were early days and it was not powered to, um, uh, to demonstrate a, a statistically significant effect, the idea was that potentially those patients who received aromoclamol um, would have a slower progression than those patients who received placebo. So this was studied um, a, a number of years ago, but this is where the idea came from, was the idea about um, uh, protein misfolding and improving protein misfolding as a potential upstream mechanism for uh, modulating cell death. So pay attention to this one because it's in its final phase. So as we move very peripherally, what about muscle targets? So we don't think that muscle targeting muscle is going to be a cure for ALS, but could this be offer clinically meaningful um, benefit for uh, ALS patients? And the idea in particular is to target the diaphragm muscle, which is a main player in, um, in ALS mortality. So these are two drugs. Cytokinetics has been in this game for a long period of time both looking at a, a heart failure as well as in ALS, and they run several ALS trials. And the idea is that rel deceptive, their newest iteration, <clears throat> acts to um, uh, uh, sensitize, if you will, troponin C and to act to improve uh, the efficiency with which the troponin tropomycin uh, complex um, uh, results in uh, muscle contraction. So these are, uh, troponin C um, sensitizing agents. Similarly, this compound called levosimindan, which is already available for heart failure in Europe, um, um, studied by Orion Pharmaceuticals, uh, the design was very similar. So these, both of these drugs came off interesting um, uh, early cl uh, clinical data. This was a phase two study for reldesemptive, which showed positive trends, but not statistically significant differences in a number of key outcome measures, which spawned um, cytokinetics to now propose a phase three study, which is upcoming. Levosimindan was um, uh, 
piggybacked off this early and very small study in patients looking at diaphragm function. And um, the top line data for this drug were recently made available suggesting that it was not necessarily beneficial um, in uh, improving diaphragm function, if you will. And those data will be presented at the Motor Neuron Disease, uh, International Motor Neuron Disease Meeting in December. But nevertheless, potentially interesting targets as we think about other uh, therapeutic strategies. Uh, I can't finish without talking about stem cell therapies. And I think particularly because um, the results of this particular study are gonna be made um, available uh, probably with by the end of this month or at least by the end of the year. So stem cell therapies, you should be, know about this drug. It's called Neurone. These are mesenchymal stem cells from this company called Brainstorm Therapeutics where uh, bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells are harvested then expanded ex vivo through a proprietary um, strategy where these cells are differentiated and made to enhance the release of neurotrophic factors and potential other factors um, secreted, if you will, from these mesenchymal stem cells. And then they undergo transplantation back into the cerebrospinal fluid uh, via lumbar puncture, much as I showed you for the antisense oligonucleotide. So where did the, where did the enthusiasm for this come, for this drug, if you will, come from, from an original study, which was a phase two study where patients were, were given this um, injection of, of, of stem cells and then monitored from their cerebral spinal fluid, as well as monitored clinically over a period of a number of weeks. And maybe the most interesting elements were in the cerebral spinal fluid, there was a suggestion that patients who received mesenchymal stem cells had increases in neurotrophic factor like VEGF, HGF, LIF, and a reduction in some of these cytokines, MCP1, SDF1, CHIT1. So there's a suggestion that this may serve as a biomarker to suggest these stem cells may be doing something. There were also some very early um, suggestions in some of the responders that the ALS functional rating scale may be slowing. Um, to a lesser degree, but I think the jury would still be out. And they, they're really gone to now a, a phase three definitive trial, which for which the results are expected at the end of this month <coughs> with 200 ALS patients. They're treated at three time points, time zero, eight, and 16 weeks with cerebral spinal fluid collected a, over a long time frame, with the primary outcome measure being the ALS functional rating scale. Um, the primary endpoint will be to look at this ALS functional rating scale and we'll have more data, like I say, soon regarding the potential efficacy uh, of, this, uh, of this therapeutic intervention. So I wanna just, in the last couple slides, um, just highlight um, you know, this, this um, lecture series, um, which is being sponsored by this, this new clinical trials unit effort. Um, in dark green here, this is just the Hopkins, um, in dark green are ALS clinical trials and clinical research efforts that are actively going on. Those in light green here are those that are um, uh, upcoming within the next few weeks. And then in red are some of our previous, so really over the last year or two, some previously uh, concluded um, trials. So, you know, this, this, this group is in, involved in not only in, in clinical trials, testing therapeutic compounds, but also in ALS um, relevant research uh, through a variety of different um, means. And you'll be hearing about those, I'm hoping, over the next year. So this group is really, this is kind of the, the, the team for the clinical trials unit, um, which really um, meshes seamlessly with the ALS uh, multidisciplinary clinic and a lot of our ALS clinical research investigators who I've highlighted here. So before I take questions, our next um, speaker, I, I mean this to be a national and international effort. Um, so our next speaker in the, in the lecture series will be Jinzi Andrews. She's an associate professor at Columbia University and co-chair of the NEALS Consortium. And Lindsay really brings a, a, a wonderful expertise because she spent a number of years in, uh, in, in pharma. So she'll bring some unique perspectives. And so she's gonna speak to challenges for drug development in ALS. Uh, it'll be a very different discussion than what you've had today. And that'll be Thursday, December 17th. I hope you will all um, uh, once again join us. So I will finish there and um, Feel free to insert in the chat box questions if you have them, or if you um, want to um, unmute yourself, I'm happy to take questions.
terrific. I think that's, so I'm glad to see that was crystal, that was crystal clear. I think what I wanted to do today was really, um, I didn't choose every single clinical trial um, because we could have gone on for another hour, which is something we've never had to do, never, not, never been able to do in ALS. But what I hope I was able to show you just, you know, just some selected drugs, some of which are a little bit more mature in the clinical trial pathway and hopefully hope highlight for some of our basic scientists as well, how we've really um, leveraged some of those basic science strategies to get there. Um, so um, um, Hyundai Osdenler uh, uh, asked, um, in the future, do I think there will be combinatorial studies? Um, so I think there's a couple of ways of thinking about that. One is, one could argue right now that we already are doing combinatorial studies. And the reason behind that is um, because Riliazole and also to a lesser degree, Adarivone are standards of care, every one, most of these clinical trials will allow patients to be on those uh, compounds, either one of them or both of them, as well as the, as well as the compound of interest. And interestingly, you, you, the idea behind Adarivone is that it acts on cellular stress, really is all as an anti-glutamatergic, and then the drugs of interest might have a third pathway. So one could argue that those in and of themselves are combinatorial pathways. Um, so I think the answer is potentially yes with regard to other, um, other investigating compounds. Could we target two potential pathways? And that's really in a way what the Amylix compound is. It's a combination of two drugs, sodium phenylbutyrate and terusa dry, I can't say that, Tudka uh, is the second drug. So that it is in a way a combinatorial therapy. What was not included in that study was independent use of those, uh, uh, of those drugs. But I imagine we'll see a day where much like oncology, this, these will be, these will be um, cocktails, if you will. Uh, when patients take other drugs when on clinical trials, how will we know that the observed result is due to the tested compound you think? So um, patients are then stratified. So it, let's say you know we have groups of patients. Let's say use um, uh, Riliazole as an example. Um, so patients are stratified for Riliazole use and randomized um, uh, according to Riliazole use. So that that shouldn't be unless the unless the statistical analyses become confusing. Those those we should be able to separate those effects. You know you're. Some patients take supplements, so could there be other pharmacodynamic interactions? That's certainly possible, but we try to control for those for those that we can. Great. Great. Um, any other questions today? Perfect. Well, I want to thank everyone who joined today. Um, oh, one more here. Um, are there any clinical trials targeting other non-neuronal cells, cells than microglia um, in the pipeline? Um, so I would argue that several of these pathways are probably relevant to, astro to astrocyte-mediated um, phenomenon as well. So you know, we talked about release of things like cytokines, and so astrocytes do those as well. And there's a lot of microglial astrocyte crosstalk. And to your point, a number of those targets aren't unique to microglia, but are also on other non-neuronal cells as well. Um, I can't speak to oligodendrocytes um, currently um, with regard to oligodendrocyte biology. Um, certainly, muscle would be a non, um, you know, a, a non-neuronal cell. Um, but, but to your point, I think there's an interplay for a lot of these different cell types. Great. Well, thank you all again. I'll let you get <clears throat> to your next meeting. Uh, I look forward to seeing you on December 17th. Um, I hope this is a, a good time for people. There's so many times in the day that uh, I know you're all busy with meetings, but I'd like to thank those of you who joined and hopefully we'll see you next month for another talk. Bye-bye.